are going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and spend a little time doing what we've spent a few Wednesdays doing, and that is hearing Paul give a little bit of a defense to his credentials as an apostle. This has been an ongoing problem between him and the church in Corinth, which is unfortunate because he's helped start the church in Corinth, and they continue to not give him uh, much credit and to not listen to what he's telling them, uh, kind of arguing, well, you're not blessed by God, you're not a real apostle, and Paul is defending that, not so much just for his own ego, but the fact that he's defending his title and position as an apostle because of the importance of what he has to say. He's defending uh, what he's saying on behalf of God to them. That's what he's most concerned about. And what's unfortunate is we're going to see in this chapter is in lieu of honoring him and listening to him and giving what he says uh, authority as a word from God, they are listening to others and those others are leading them astray. And so that's what we'll see in this chapter. And so beginning in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. Uh, Paul is not calling the defense that's coming in the following verses uh, foolishness or folly, depending on your translation, because it's nonsense or because it's stupid, another word that we would use for foolishness. He calls it folly. He calls it foolishness because he's reluctantly doing this because he knows that he could be spending his time uh, doing things that uh, uh, are more helpful. In other words, it I wish you'd bear with me a little foolish. In other words, it's, it's foolish I'm having to spend more time Uh, defending myself. Uh, I would rather spend this time teaching things uh, more productively, but he calls it folly because uh, he knows that the things he believed to be honorable about his apostleship would be regarded as foolishness by uh, the Corinthians. And so this is the language that he is using. And, and, And so he's going to explain in, in these following verses, uh, what they consider foolishness and what he wishes. He's, it's almost foolish how much time I'm having to spend on this. Verse 2, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Uh, there's some interesting language he used in these verses. And... Uh, we read a word like jealousy and we immediately think, well, that's not good. It's not good to be jealous. We, we speak ill of jealousy. But uh, Paul is jealous with a divine jealousy. Some of your translations will say godly jealousy. But he is jealous for their hearts. Uh, godly jealousy from Paul is a good thing in this situation. Uh, He is jealous uh, because he does not want the Corinthians to be uh, lured away by false teaching and by false understanding uh, from what others are teaching. And so he has this divine jealousy uh, for them that they not be uh, distracted or lured away by others that are teaching uh, a false doctrine. And so... We know that human jealousy, that's a vice, that's wrong. Uh, We don't want to be jealous, but there is a godly jealousy or a divine jealousy uh, that ESV uses here that is good. Uh, We know that from Exodus chapter 20, God describes himself as uh, a jealous God. Uh, He says, I am the Lord your God and I am a jealous God. And so, We know that part of God's character is this divine jealousy. And uh, and so there is, um, he's not jealous for us, of us, he's jealous uh, for us. And so we, it can be a virtue and we share that jealousy uh, with God in that we want him to have 
uh, our attention. We can be uh, jealous of others that distract from that. And so God's jealousy, therefore, is ultimately a concern for holiness, uh, for integrity, for purity, for devotion. And so that's the kind of jealousy that, that Paul has for the church in Corinth. And what an interesting description. And what a way for Paul to see his role in this second part of verse 2. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So in these verses, it's, it's important that the church in Corinth understand Paul's role as an apostle. And, and, and what he's saying is, I'm like that, that friend of, of the groom that watches out for the bride during that time of betrothal uh, leading up to the wedding. So Paul considers himself in that role uh, as one who is protecting the bride so that he can present her pure to her husband on the wedding day. And in the Jewish culture of that day, a friend of the bridegroom, which is mentioned also in the Gospel of John, mentions this role of the friend of the bridegroom. Uh, he had or she had an important job. Uh, their job was to pronounce to uh, and to procure for the husband uh, a virgin, to guard her, to bear testimony uh, to her, uh, to the groom on the wedding day. And so uh, they would serve as kind of this uh, uh, person on behalf of the groom to protect and present the bride to uh, her husband on the wedding day. And so this is the role that Paul, <laughs> that Paul sees himself, that I want to present you as the bride of, of Christ. I want to present you as, as holy. And so I'm doing everything I can as an apostle, as, as the leader, to, to protect you from this false doctrine so I can present to you, to Christ, pure and, and holy and unstained by, by false teaching. And so... Uh, he's, that's how he's explaining uh, his role as an apostle to the church in Corinth. And this time of betrothal in the Jewish culture was not taken lightly. If someone was unfaithful, even during that betrothal period, what we would call an engagement period, uh, it was considered adultery and it would still have to be broken by divorce. And so it was a very official time uh, this even betrothal period in, in Jewish custom. And so this isn't just, you know, this casual relationship. Uh, this is a serious time, and Paul is taking his role very seriously as the friend of the groom here. Verse 3, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So uh, the, the church in Corinth, they did not admire and respect Paul and his credentials as an apostle uh, because they were thinking in a worldly way, uh, not uh, by uh, a way that was um, led by Christ. And so as a result, they were being deceived. Just as Eve was deceived by Satan, so was the church in Corinth. And Paul understood that Satan's deception of Eve in the Garden of Eden is, is a good example of his tactics even for us today. That uh, his lie to Eve was, was kind of a, uh, surrounded by half-truths. It was a lot of half-truths that Satan presented to Eve in, in a way to deceive her. And in the same way, the church in Corinth was, was buying into a lot of half-truths that they were being taught. And as a result, they were being uh, lured in by the serpent, by Satan, just in the same way that Eve was led astray, they were being led astray from a sincere and pure devotion. Again, Christ's goal is to present to them pure and, and holy to Christ, and uh, instead they're being led astray by false teaching, which is leaving them unpure. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, 
Or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And so uh, he's, again, any gospel that's being taught that's contrary to what Paul is teaching is uh, a false doctrine, is a false gospel. Uh, he, Paul is confident that he's teaching the truth. He's teaching God's word. And so anything other than that is false, is wrong. And uh, the church in Corinth was having a similar problem than, than churches, many churches do today. It's not surprising that they are false teachers. They're always going to be false teachers. Uh, the problem was that the church in Corinth was putting up with this false teaching. They, they weren't versed, well versed enough to discern false teaching and they weren't doing anything about the false teaching. They weren't protecting themselves from these false teachers. And it's the same way today. There, there are always going to be false teachers in, in, in every generation. There are going to be false teachers. What we have to do is protect ourselves from false teaching. That begins with knowing the truth. We study the truth, we learn the truth, we know the truth so that we can discern what is false. And that's what Paul's saying here. Anything that's contrary to what I've, I've been teaching you is false. And, and what's unfortunate is they were accepting it. Not that it was happening, it's always going to be happening. Uh, but they weren't protecting themselves from the false teaching. Verse 5, Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Uh, so Paul here is comparing himself. And <laughs> Paul is so sarcastic. Uh, and again, uses it here. Uh, I, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. <laughs> He's kind of mocking them. Uh, uh, when he refers to them as super apostles, uh, different translations, we use different uh, eminent, most eminent apostles. Uh, and so he's, he's speaking rather sarcastically here about these false apostles. They were claiming to be superior to Paul. Basically, they were saying, and, and you've heard this from false teachers before, I've got something new. This is different from anything you've ever heard before, which, you know, is there anything new under the sun? And so warning light should be going off when all of a sudden someone shows up with something new that's never been taught before. Uh, but in their new teaching, they were claiming that it was superior to what Paul had been teaching. Paul, look at him. He's got all these problems. He's not a good speaker. He's not being blessed by God. Look at all these shipwrecks and times he's been beaten and times he's been arrested. Don't listen to him. We have something better to say. And look, we're, we're wealthy and prominent and better speakers. Listen to us. We are, they were claiming probably to be super apostles, which is why he kind of sarcastically calls them super apostles. And by saying, look, I'm not inferior to them. Yeah, I may be inferior to them in my speech, uh, and he may be inferior to them in, in physical presence because uh, we know he had some physical issues. Uh, and so he's acknowledging that by worldly eyes, by worldly vision, by worldly standards, it may look like he's inferior. But uh, even though he might not speak as eloquently and may not have the physical appearance of these super apostles, he does uh, defend that he is not inferior. And in fact, in, uh, especially in knowledge. Yeah, in speech, he may not be as eloquent but, or polished or as sophisticated, but uh, he was knowledgeable. And that is ultimately what we want. Uh, there can be a lot of eloquent speakers out there that speak heresy, but they can do it really well. Uh, that's why I, I, I never claim to be an eloquent speaker, but I do try and just speak truth. Uh, kind of like, I mean, I'm not comparing myself to Paul at all. Don't hear that. But uh, I, I, I'm never going to impress anyone with eloquence, but I at least can say I'm speaking the truth and let the gospel, let God's word speak for itself. There was a, a, a story I've heard a few times 
uh, and one of the commentators reminded me of it. Uh, a story is told about a dinner party where the guests were expected to stand after the meal and recite something for the group. It's kind of entertainment after the meal. A famous actor was present, and he recited the 23rd Psalm with great dramatic flair and emotion. And then he sat down to great applause. Then a very simple man got up and began to recite the same psalm. He wasn't eloquent at all. So at first, people thought it was a little funny. But his presentation was straight from the heart. And so when he finished, the group sat in respectful silence. It was obvious that the simple man's presentation was more powerful than the actor's. And afterwards, the actor told him, I know the psalm, but you know the shepherd in the psalm. And so uh, a, lot of, a lot of people can really, I mean, wax eloquent on a stage and even on TV, but that doesn't mean that what they're saying is, is truth. And so Paul's saying, look, I realize I don't speak like they do, but I'm knowledgeable of the truth. And so that's uh, his defense in these verses. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. In, in the culture of that day, if a, if a public speaker, if someone that traveled around and, and spoke, did lectures or spoke in the temple and didn't take money for his speaking... That was kind of an understanding that that meant they weren't a very good speaker. That if you didn't warrant payment, then you weren't a good speaker at all. Or the teaching was considered worthless if it wasn't worthy of payment. And so many people thought of someone who charged no speaking fee as kind of an amateur. They're just going around talking. They don't have anything good to say uh, because they're not charging. But Paul, Paul uh, is, is defending himself that, yes, he did not receive payment from the church in Corinth. And, but, of course, in his irony, he says, did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Uh, and verse 8, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. Uh, Paul's referring to the fact that he received support from Christians in other cities during his time in Corinth. They didn't respect his uh, authority as an apostle. They did not pay him, but he did receive uh, payment from uh, the other churches uh, that were sending him money, specifically from the regions of Macedonia, where the areas, uh, including the church in Philippi, were the ones uh, supporting him. We know that because when he wrote his letter to the church in Philippi, Philippians, he thanked them for their generosity and support of him while he was ministering in Corinth. And so uh, this is, again, his kind of sarcastic way of saying, I was receiving support, just wasn't from you. <laughs> and then, and when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. And so uh, we see that even when he was with them, he didn't ask for money, didn't expect money. He was receiving money, but it wasn't from the church in Corinth. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you, God knows I do. Uh, and so as a, as a true apostle, Paul could boast. I know boast has negative connotations uh, when we usually think about it, but uh, he could boast that he took no money uh, from them, that he was more interested in the integrity of his message than he was in his own needs. Even when he was in need, as they didn't give to him, uh, he was more concerned about what he was teaching than uh, receiving payment from the church in Corinth. And Paul's boasting in his weakness and unimpressive image, uh, it, it's funny. What Paul was boasting in, they thought was uh, not impressive. What he was boasting in was his weaknesses. Ultimately, he was boasting his weaknesses because when you boast in your weaknesses, who does it point to? God. Uh, and so 
it's funny what he's boasting in. The church in Corinth was like, why in the world would you boast in those things? You're boasting in all the weaknesses you have. But Paul knew that when he boasted in his weaknesses that would point to uh, God. Those things were an embarrassment to the church in Corinth, but they were worth boasting for Paul because he knew they ultimately pointed to God. And so, uh, again, defends his love for them uh, in verse 11. And what am I doing and what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. So he's going to continue uh, speaking the truth. Uh, he's going to continue to uh, teach God's word, uh, despite the fact that false teachers are, are uh, attacking him and teaching a, a foreign gospel. He's going to continue to be faithful, whether it results in them giving him money or not. He's going to continue speaking the truth. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Uh, even Satan uh, will appear the phrase he uses is an angel of light. And so false apostles are going to have a good appearance as well. Uh, Paul's showing that it's foolish to rely just on outward appearances. Sometimes we put a lot of stock in just outward appearances. That's a good looking suit. That guy must know what he's talking about. And so uh, we instantly will give them a lot of credit just because they look the game or they have that cool little pocket square, you know, whatever we, we value outward appearance wise to say they're successful. They must know what they're talking about. In the same way, uh, the church in Corinth, these false apostles, they looked the part. They they looked like they knew what they were doing. It looked like uh, their ministries were being blessed. But in the same way that Satan dis disguises himself as an angel of light, in the same way his, uh, as it were, his servants can disguise themselves as well. And so uh, Satan, he can take that form of that subtle serpent. Uh, he can also take uh, the form of an angel of light light. Uh, and this is the reference that Paul is using here. Verse 16, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. What I'm saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord what I, not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast, for you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. Uh, more sarcasm. He says, well, if you like bearing with fools so much by listening to these false teachers, well then give this fool a minute <laughs> and listen to me, and I'm going to boast. But again, this is boasting as we read his boasting, it's boasting in weakness. It's complete opposite of what the church in Corinth would expect him to uh, boast in. And, and I'll read his boasting, uh, but it's things you're familiar with. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. This is what they're dealing with with these false teachers. And yet they keep listening to them and keep giving them respect. I mean, these, these, they're taking advantage of the people of the church in Corinth, uh, taking money of them, making slaves of them. I mean, taking advantage of them, yet they still keep following these false teachers. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. So he keeps leading up to what he's going to boast in. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. So this is where he starts his boasting, which 
Doesn't make sense to the church in Corinth because they think he's going to boast of all his accolades. And here he speaks of his weaknesses. But that's the point Paul's making. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my Weakness. So again, after all this talk of boasting, which we're like, hey, it's not good to boast. He boasts in his weakness, ultimately so he can point to God. The God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, he who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. Damascus, the governor under King Eridus, was guarded the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. All right, so again, he led up to a lot of, uh, let me boast, let me boast. He gets to that point where he does boast, and it's all in his weaknesses, again, to just point to uh, God, that God's at work uh, through those weaknesses, that God has delivered him through those uh, uh, challenges uh, that he lists. And so um, we see uh, Paul the Apostle, left Damascus in a basket at the end of this. Uh, and if there is anything more uh, descriptive of weakness than that, than being let down in a basket over a wall, I couldn't think of it. And, uh, but even through those weaknesses, uh, it points to the power, protection, provision of God. And so uh, Paul, Paul's an interesting character especially in dealing with this church in Corinth, uh, complete with uh, a good bit of sarcasm. And, uh, and you can see his concern as they're being led astray uh, and just not listening uh, to him, even though he's the voice speaking on behalf of God to them as an apostle. All right, so we will pick up in chapter 12 next week where... Uh, we're going to deal with a, a vision that Paul receives and talk a little bit about the, his legacy uh, as an apostle in the last uh, few chapters. All right. I realize we've kind of had an ongoing theme of Paul defending himself and his uh, role as an apostle, which isn't always directly applicable, but uh, still God's word and important to know it. All right, let's read. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, those that, that speak the truth. And thank you for uh, this church and how you have blessed it through the years to be filled with people who are concerned for the truth, who uh, know the truth, who are ready to point out falsehood. And Father, we thank you for uh, just over a hundred years of, of your faithfulness and men and women's faithfulness to continue to seek the truth of your word. And Father, may that be uh, the cornerstone of, of our church for the next hundred years. Even when uh, promoting truth can be difficult in, in a culture that moves further away from you, Father, may we be that, that lighthouse, that beacon of uh, the truth of your word. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.